All right, folks, let's take a look at our last topic, and that is modes of evolution. So how does natural selection take place? We've talked a lot about natural selection and talked a lot about evolution, but how does all of this happen? What are some ways in which natural selection can take place, and how does evolution happen over a period of time? So we're going to look at the details of that and discuss a little about different modes of evolution. And natural selection isn't the only way that a population's genetics can change over time. So we're going to look briefly at a couple of other ways that this can happen as well. So, hopefully you're going to be able to, at the end of this, explain ways natural selection changes the gene population, or the gene frequency, rather, for a population. If you remember natural selection, certain traits are selected for by the environment, right? Certain traits are advantageous to a species by the environment. Um, those traits allow the species to survive. Those traits get passed on to the next generation. And soon you see more and more of the species with those traits over time. The genes become more frequent. The genes of those that are less advantageous become less frequent over time. All right? So just a reminder of what natural selection is and how that works. And you should be able to predict how evolution will occur in a variety of different scenarios. Okay? So let's move on. Remember, an adaption is simply a trait that is used to increase the survival of a species, and it all depends on the environment. Remember that certain adaptions or adaptations are beneficial for those in a desert, may not necessarily be beneficial for those in a forest. All right, so keep that in mind. Uh, for example, the giraffe's neck, the tall neck of the giraffe, allows it to reach food on higher trees. Because of this, it is able to survive better than those with the short neck. It is able to reproduce and pass that tall neck trait to the offspring. So more and more offspring are tall than short. Fitness is a term that is used frequently. When you talk about evolution and natural selection, and fitness is just how likely an organism will have reproductive success. So we look at species and we get a better understanding of how they can be successful uh, based upon their fitness, all right? Those with good traits, those with advantageous traits are said to have high fitness. And those that have traits that are not advantageous, that don't give them advantage, are said to have low fitness, all right? So keep those in terms in mind as we go through this. What are some types of adaption uh, or adaptations? We will first look at mimicry. And mimicry just is a species that evolves to look like another species. One example is the king snake and the coral snake. The coral snake is on the bottom and the king snake is on the top. A predator uh, will see the king snake and because of its banding pattern will actually look similar to that of a coral snake. Now coral snakes are dangerous, they are deadly. So species know they are not to go near them, they are not to touch them because they are to cause significant harm or even death. All right, that banding pattern is known in the animal kingdom to stay away from that. The king snake has adapted over time to develop this uh, pattern that mimics that of the coral snake. So those that mimic the coral snake are not eaten by predators. And so as a result, that trait gets passed on. And you see in more and more king snakes that have this banding pattern. All right, so those that don't have it, the predators don't recognize it as something that could be dangerous, and they eat it, okay? But because of the banding pattern that the king snake has, because it's similar to that of the coral snake, the animals stay away. And so mimicry can be very beneficial to a species, especially if it mimics a species that is poisonous or deadly. Camouflage is a species that evolves to blend in with its environment. You look at the toad at the bottom. That blends in really, really well with the environment in which it's placed. So you place this toad next to a toad that does not blend in, which one is the predator going to eat? Well, the one that does not blend in. And so the trait for blending in survives, reproduces, and they get to pass that on to the next generation. So more and more of the toad species becomes camouflaged over time. All right? You know that the camouflage benefits the species. It gives it an advantage in the environment. Antibiotic resistance is interesting as well because the abuse of antibiotics has led to antibiotic-resistant bacteria. A long, long time ago, the only antibiotic that was available was penicillin, and it killed most of the bacteria that caused infections. However, when people take antibiotics, many times they stop taking it, even though they start feeling better. All right, you know, you get a prescription for 10 days worth of antibiotics, and you take it for, you know, seven or eight. 
that's fine. But that doesn't kill all the bacteria. That only kills 99% of the bacteria or so. That 1% of the bacteria develops a resistance to that antibiotic. So the next generation, you have 5% of the antibiotic, the bacteria are resistant. That, it, that antibiotic resistance is a trait that is beneficial for the species because it allows it to survive better in that particular environment, correct? If you take that antibiotic again, it will not work because those antibiotic resistant bacteria that aren't harmed by the antibiotic. So it's very interesting how this has developed over time, but as a result, we've had to develop new and stronger antibiotics. And as a result, we've had to develop this kind of cat and mouse game of what is the bacteria going to evolve into, and then what antibiotic can we develop to stop it. So we developed this class of super bacteria, these super bugs that you've probably heard, things like MRSA, right? Especially if you're in athletics, you've probably heard of MRSA. Uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's resistant to most bacteria or most antibiotics because it has developed that resistance over time due to the overprescribing and overuse of antibiotics in this country. So, what are some mechanisms in evolution? Well, one is what's called stabilizing selection, and that favors the intermediate. That favors traits that are in the middle. All right. So, one example is spider size. If you have a spider that's big. It's easily seen by predators. If you have a spider that's too small, it's not able to hunt for food. But the spiders that are too small to be seen by predators, but yet big enough to be able to catch prey to survive, are the ones that are favored. So over time, we see that medium-sized spiders are preferred in that particular environment over large or small spiders, all right? And that is known as stabilizing selection, one that favors the intermediate, favors one that's in between the extremes of that particular trait. So when we look at traits, we can also look at directional selection that favors one extreme version of a trait. So an example of that would be the giraffe's neck. The taller the giraffe neck, the more food it is able to reach on the tops of trees. The more food it's able to get, the more likely it is to survive, reproduce, and pass those genes on to the offspring. So directional selection favors one extreme version of the trait, whether it be really, really to one end, such as really, really tall, or to another end, such as really, really short. Again, it's not just tall and short, but it's just the extremes of a particular trait. Disruptive selection is where the intermediate is actually selected against, where one that's in between is actually selected against. All right, an example of this is northern water snakes, all right, with their coat color. One extreme version of the coat color blends in with its surroundings, and the opposite extreme blends in with surroundings. But one that's actually stuck kind of in between, all right, doesn't really blend in with either of the surroundings that it exists in, all right. So this is just an example of one where it favors both extremes, but not something in the middle. So disruptive selection can actually separate two groups far enough where they cannot reproduce with each other, and this is called speciation. So if you look here, right, we talked about dis, uh, we talked about disruptive selection, where you get two peaks, one favors both extremes, and over time they develop their own groups of organisms, and they only mate within those groups of organisms, and over time if they wanted to mate with each other between the different groups, they wouldn't be able to. And that is because of speciation. That is because they eventually develop so far differently from one another that they develop two different species of each other. Sexual selection is another mechanism of evolution. This is the ability to attract a mate. This is the ability to attract um, a, an organism, a, a mate, based upon certain physical characteristics. So certain traits are not necessarily ones that are advantageous. It just happens to be the ones that the uh, opposite sex is most attracted to. That's a common way to look for certain traits in an organism over time. So since we're talking about reproduction and all of the different, um, you know, since we're talking about reproduction, I think it's important to go into uh, what are some things that can prevent organisms from reproducing with one another and thus causing different species to occur, this process of speciation. And um, there are two different types of topics that we can look at. One is known as pre-zygotic isolation, and that prevents the reproduction before fertilization. So this is things like geography, right? If two sets of the same organism live in different uh, geographies, they have a hard time mating with each other if there's a mountain range in between them. 
this can um, prevent them from mating with each other and as a result speciation would occur. Another one is called post-zygotic isolation. And this is the things that prevent reproduction after fertilization. This is where we maybe produce sterile offspring, like a mule, like for example, which is the cross between a donkey and a horse, right? They mate two different species and produce an offspring, but that offspring cannot produce any more offspring, all right? Or if the two species have a different number of chromosomes, it doesn't work out. You think like meiosis, right? We're making sperm and egg. Uh, humans have 23 uh, in each sperm or egg, but different organisms have different numbers. And so if the numbers don't match up, then we cannot get a, a zygote. Um, we can't get a zygote, and then as a result, we can't get a viable offspring from that. All right, so prezygotic, postzygotic isolation, just two ways that different organisms or similar species, rather, cannot mate with each other and thus producing uh, speciation. All right, some patterns of evolution that I think are important to understand. We have what's called adaptive radiation, and this is the one that's the most common, where a single ancestor diverges into many species due to environmental pressures. You can think of things like Darwin's finches, right? Darwin found many different finch species on the island, but found that they all were related to one of the finches that was present on mainland South America. And so as a result, he understood that that particular species evolved over time into five different species through the process of natural selection and adaptive radiation. Each one of those species has a beak that is useful in a different niche, all right, thus allowing the finch population to survive, all right. The, each one of those beaks gives that particular finch an advantage over the other finches, whether it's looking for fruit or grubs or using tools or eating insects or leaves, all right? All of those give them an advantage, and if they have that advantage, they're able to survive, reproduce, and pass those traits on to their offspring, all right? Um, Coevolution, some species may even evolve together if it is in a symbiotic relationship. I don't want you to think of evolution as something that kind of starts and stops. It is continual. Every species is evolving in some way, shape, or form. Every species has traits that give it an advantage. And it is not just one of those things where it starts and then stops. Different species are evolving to react to other species evolving. All right? It's, it's a complicated process. It's a confusing process, but it's a fascinating one. And coevolution is really what you see frequently in, in science, is that one species evolves, another species uh, evolves that reacts to it, okay? So if one species gets an advantage, then another species evolves in order to, to eliminate that advantage, all right? We talked a little bit about how, um, you know, insects. And let's use the Darwin's uh, finch as an example, that insect eating one. And that beak is used to, to eat through insects. Well, the insects that aren't eaten may have a trait that allows them to survive, reproduce, and pass that trait on to the offspring that prevent them from being eaten. So you see how that in of itself causes evolution. The evolution of that beak caused the evolution of the grub. And that, as a result, because the finch can no longer get to those grubs, the finch may eventually, there may be a trait that allows it to get those grubs that aren't normally uh, able to be got to, aren't normally able to be eaten by the other insect finch. And so as a result, it's this give and take relationship. It's very, very confusing and complex, but it's this give and take relationship of coevolution that really drives the planet. Another species is what's called convergent evolution, and this is where two unrelated species may develop similar traits due to just similar environments. You look at the picture, you have the armadillo, the anteaters, um, and the pangolin. And all of these developed this casing, the shell, on the outside of their bodies that has developed over time as a result of convergent evolution, where two species develop similar traits due to similar environments. So we can understand that it is, yes, it is the environment that controls evolution. It is the environment that controls natural selection in this process that takes place over a long, long period of time. All right? So... Hopefully you understand just about some ways that natural selection can change gene frequencies in a population and predict how evolution will occur in a variety of scenarios. We'll talk a little bit about this a little bit later on, and hopefully you do well on your video quiz. We'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.